the Lincoln touched a lot of lives, so many lives in his 58 years. How blessed we are to have walked beside him. I want to recognize particularly Lincoln's loving and amazing wife of 29 years, Maureen. You are the most courageous person I know. Loyal and beautiful. It's an honor, truly an honor to call you sister. Thank you for making Lincoln's final days full of peace, grace, love, tenderness, acceptance, and beauty. You rock. <laughs> oh! I love you so much. So, I, <laughs> I could have Googled how to write a eulogy, and I would have come up with some pretty cool stuff, I'm sure of that. But, see, I have my dad looking over my shoulder, and I can still recall him scoring a particular politician in Kamloops for, as he put it, not having an original plot in his head. So, this doesn't come off the internet, it comes straight from the heart. And I did ask my family for memories too, so some of this incorporates their memories of Lincoln, it's not all, not all mine. The boy. Lincoln was born on May 14, 1957 in Nelson. He was the sixth of 12 Nicholas children. Sisters and brothers are Sharon, Shirley, Tony, Joe, Georgia, Mary, Marty, Michelle, Danielle, Nancy, Adam. <laughs> Too bad you're such a tiny family. You always knew when Lincoln was around, even as a young boy. He was so full of life, so full of mischief, so funny, so full of humor. I remember him as a kid. He was always running around the house, bare-chested, bare-footed, tan. These are obviously summertime memories. He was always wearing jeans, and with that fun-loving, mischievous grin, he was always making trouble. Seems that he was always chasing those girls around the house, usually with stink bugs, which explains why I am truly phobic of those to this day. <laughs> Ask Andy. <laughs> Lincoln, he liked to tease. So I'm not sure who thought of it first, could have been Georgia. But my money's on Lincoln, thinking, hmm, here we have a good hot summer day. Two-year-old Margie, maybe I was three, I don't really recall. No adults around to supervise, apparently, and some cows doing nothing. That was the day I learned how to ride a cow. <laughs> Remember? I wouldn't say I learned how to ride a cow as much as I learned why we don't ride cows. We ride horses. What do they say about leadership? Leadership is described as action and example. Lincoln was a leader. The night of November 7, 1969 was a cold and very dark night. Lincoln would have been 12, George was 13, I was 7. Michelle and Danielle were just babies. And they were in bed upstairs for the night. We were in the kitchen with Mom, Georgia and Lincoln and I. I think Georgia and Mom were preparing dinner, and back in those days, uh, we cooked on a family, we cooked family dinner on, on a wood stove. And I believe Lincoln was man of the house that night, meaning the older siblings were out for the night. And the wood stove needed to be lit. Dad told me later that we didn't know it at the time, but the fuel we bought to light the wood stove had we'd been given a bad mix and it contained gasoline. And that's what Lincoln was about to use to light the stove. I recall sitting on a chair between the stove and the glass doors, watching him. I can still see him bare chested in his jeans with that can tilted towards the stove. And it was at that moment that I heard a voice in my head that said, Mark, it's time to go upstairs. I didn't ignore it. I walked through the kitchen. I was halfway upstairs when the kitchen simply exploded. I don't always listen to the voices in my head, but when I do, it seems to work out all right. I'm here today to tell you the story. <laughs> the wood frame house that we lived in went up in flames. The family that was home that night escaped simply with the clothes on our backs. And I remember we all congregated out in the front yard, and uh, that's when Lincoln ran back into the burning house. My mother was screaming out not to go in there, we probably all were. 
but there would have been no stopping him. He ran back into the flames. He grabbed my dad's 375 H&H Magnum, as I recall. Mom's antique <laughs> and a very precious vase. And he stopped in the hallway and grabbed coats for us. To this day, I'm not even sure that there was a coat for him when it was all over. Lincoln was brave. The brother. Lincoln was also highly competitive and incredibly intelligent. Gifted at a lot of things, as I recall. Particularly pursuits involving mathematical skill and logic. And unfortunately for Mr. Hendricks, his grade four teacher, that made him an excellent chess player. They had a game, which Mr. Hendricks challenged Lincoln to, much to his dismay, I'm sure, because 10 minutes later, Lincoln won that game. Shortly after that, he got promoted to the grade five class. <laughs> But as I recall, he would occasionally lose at board games, and I remember Monopoly in particular. It wasn't often that it happened, but when it happened, it wasn't a pretty sight. <laughs> I'm not saying he had a bad temper or anything. I mean, it wasn't quite the Jerry Springer show, but close. <laughs> I remember buying him a, a sweatshirt, probably for a birthday, and it said, I'm a sore loser across the front. Yeah, that didn't go over very well. <sighs> it was probably Marky's dying act. <laughs> <laughs> sure felt like it. Somehow I survived it. I <coughs> will tell you, Lincoln wasn't just competitive, he was a winner. Bobby Bear must have written that song, The Winner, about my brother. In grade 9 math class, Lincoln would have the problem solved and be shouting out the answer before Mr. Darnell could finish writing out the problem on the board. In later grades, the teacher would simply say, Okay, everyone but Lincoln, what's your answer? <laughs> I guess that set the stage for how, in later years, he would sit on the couch and yell at all the dumb people on Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune. He always had the answer solved the way the four contestants did. He was no slouch. He convinced Georgia, our sister, that they should sneak into the teacher's desk in grade six to look at their IQ score tests. She clearly remembers Lincoln's score. It was 131. Georgia reminded Lincoln recently that it was only four points higher than her own. <laughs> Okay, now I did Google one thing. IQ scores and what they mean. It's what you would expect. Lincoln had very high intelligence. He was cool. He was smart. Down straight, he was good looking. <laughs> Just look at that picture. It was almost like he knew it. He was the outgoing, sociable one who would talk with everyone. From the guy next door to his little sisters, telling the girls that if they want to grow up big and strong like him, they should eat their veggies. He loved to joke around, he loved to laugh. He loved to make others laugh, and I'm sure every single one of you in this room has had the benefit of that. If there was a party, he was the life of it, and he loved his music. I can still hear him belting out Billy Idol's Rebel Yell. In the midnight hours, she cried more and more and more. <laughs> he loved to sing. The man. Most of you know that Lincoln had a terrible motorbike accident when he was about 21. Some say he had an angel looking out for him that night. Probably it was her sister Sharon. She left us when she was 16. His injuries were serious and he was flown to Vancouver General Hospital. On the way, he developed pneumonia and needed a tracheotomy to save his life. Like most families, when something bad happens to a member of our family, family comes together. We rented a car, us brothers and sisters. We drove as fast as we could to Vancouver. Still remember leaning over and looking at the speedometer and seeing 130 and thinking that is the fastest I've ever gone. God, I hope we get there. We did. But we weren't pissing around either. <laughs> We'd heard stories of him walking the hallways of the hospital with a garbage can, apparently planting trees, and we were wondering what kind of drugs they were giving him down there in the hospital. His jaw had been broken, and when we arrived, we and he thought he couldn't talk. The nurse said he'd been communicating and writing, and so he had a pad of paper and a pen, and that's how we started out talking with him. He was writing down things, we were responding. It was a slow and frustrating process, and as you all know, Lincoln doesn't do for, didn't do frustration very well. Could be a bit impatient at times. Suddenly, there are children present, so I'll modify this. He threw the paper down with a F this and started talking. We were all so shocked, because we honestly thought he couldn't speak. We all laughed, mostly with relief, and we knew he was going to be okay. 
And he knew, when a car load of his brothers and sisters showed up, that he was loved. That support gave him the strength and determination he needed for recovery. He came home, minus the sight in one eye and the hearing in one ear, but he came home. Lincoln was a survivor. My daughter Tara was born critically ill in Fernie and needed to be flown to Calgary's neonatal intensive care unit in June of 1982. This was just a few years after Lincoln's accident. And he knew what I would be going through, wondering if she was going to survive. He had a message for me. He knew I was wrestling with whether I should check out of the hospital less than 12 hours after having delivered my baby and follow her to Calgary against the doctor's advice because he didn't think Tara would survive. And Lincoln simply told me that baby needs to know you love her. He knew that if she could feel my presence, if she could feel my touch, she'd make it. That's what got me out of bed, got me out of that hospital to Calgary, and it got me through that ordeal. And it did the same for Tara, my daughter. I never regretted his advice. Lincoln was an amazing brother. Lincoln always had a job, and after his accident, he became more serious about looking after himself financially. Tony, Joe, and Lincoln planted trees together for three years. They were the highest producing tree planters in, in the camps, and everyone wanted them on the crew. But Lincoln was independent. He liked having his own crew. And because he was pretty good at math, he quickly figured out that, you know, there's a lot of serious drinking to be done after a hard day's work. And basically, capacity-wise, if we only planted 95% of the trees, we'd get back to camp a lot faster. <laughs> Not saying what happened to the other 5%. <laughs> You know, no eulogy would be complete without talking about deeply held religious beliefs, and I mean no offense to the believers in this room. Lincoln was spiritual, as we all know. He respected the beliefs of others, and he appreciated the prayers of his family and friends, especially during his illness, and we all saw the benefit of that and the effect of those prayers on him. He faced his illness with unequaled grace and complete acceptance, and your faith had a lot to do with that. Lincoln was raised in the Catholic Church, and he was married in a Pentecostal one. He wasn't anti-religion, but he had his own brand of church. It was called the National Football League. <laughs> I doubt he ever missed a Sunday. <laughs> he was a huge fan of the Oakland Raiders, and he was lucky enough to go see his team play. I can imagine that on that day there was no louder fan in the stands than my brother. And I'd be amazed if the team didn't win that game on the strength of the decibel, decibel level alone that day. And we all know if the boys didn't show up and play their game well, he'd yell at them. His other passion was politics. Okay, Lincoln liked to argue, especially about politics. My ex-husband confided in me that when visiting Lincoln, he'd actually change political parties just so we didn't argue about that. Useless, how useless the other guys were. Lincoln was passionate, the husband. Lincoln knew he would find the woman of his dreams by the time he was 30. He met Maureen when he was 29, in his 30th year. The day he walked into her life, she took one look at that handsome man and declared, that man's not leaving my house. <laughs> and he never did. Seven years later, when she said to him, Lincoln, I think we should get married, he took one look at her and said, well, it's about time. <laughs> they were married on September 4th, 1993, and from the day they met, this couple was destined to be together. They have had a beautiful relationship. I think we all saw Lincoln mellow over the years as he grew in love with Maureen, and together they created a loving, stable, family-centered life that was an inspiration to all of us. Lincoln and Maureen were so in love it shone through their lives like a beacon. They selflessly helped others around them, looking after the needs of our mom and other family members and never asking anything in return. They were a team. Lincoln and Maureen saved all their change and put it towards the travel fund. Maureen would be rolling up the nickels to take to the bank, and invariably she was short one or two to make full roll, and she would ask Lincoln, hey Link, you got a nickel? And he would always respond, I don't have a nickel. 
I'm Nicholas. <laughs> <laughs> so one day recently, Maureen asked Lincoln what he would give her as a sign after he was gone to let her know that he was watching over her. They wanted it to be something funny and fine. They settled on a nickel. The departure. Maureen dedicated herself to ensuring Lincoln's every need was anticipated, planned for, and responded to in Lincoln's final days. There is no finer example of devotion, selfless love, nurture, tenderness, caring, and beauty than the picture I have of Maureen tending to Lincoln throughout his illness. She read to him, she sang, All You Need Is Love, while he sang, You Love Me Half As Much As I Love You. She sat with him on the bed, bed dancing to Emmy, Emmy Lou Harris and Bobby Bear. She helped him with his daily care. She held his hand as he slipped away in beauty and grace. My brother was deeply loved. Lincoln was a truly wonderful man who had a powerful presence. And so it is fitting that his departure from this life was both dramatic and beautiful. Lincoln went home on the autumn equinox accompanied by a wave of rolling thunder, the way lit with a bright bolt of lightning. The door on the sled closed, proving that change can indeed be beautiful. The future. Nothing has ever hurt me more than that lonely sound, the closing of the door. Through tear-stained eyes, I can see him walk away, and I know it's really over. He was a well-loved son, brother, husband, stepdad, grandpa, uncle, cousin, and friend. His memory lingers everywhere, and I'm not sure how we will ever go on without him. But as Andy says, Lincoln was needed somewhere else. Perhaps our dads have taken up golf, and Lincoln is keeping the greens and grooming the fairways. And maybe he's sharing a long neck, long neck with our brother Joe in the afternoon sun, telling stories, the two of them laughing, and Lincoln getting louder and louder. I bet he and Sharon are throwing sticks for our old dog Jake up on Rainbow Ridge. And we know that every day he's there, he gives our mom a hug and makes her smile. And in his spare time, he's probably selling NDP memberships. <laughs> and making the family and friends that have gone on before us all laugh with a joke and a smile. Lincoln never lived his life in a minor key, and I doubt that he's doing that now. So Maureen, when you find a nickel, and you know it wasn't there two seconds ago, don't even question it, it's your sign. Lincoln maybe needed somewhere else, but he will always be with you. <laughs>